Welcome. Today's draw along lecture will be the Palazzo Vecchio. We'll be using design markers two through nine to work through the old palace, which is the town hall of Florence, Italy. It overlooks the Piazza della Signore and holds a copy of Michelangelo's David statue in the plaza out front. Very, a very large statue. There's a very large plaza as well, so it looks diminutive next to the building now. But it's about um, four or five times the size of a human. So we'll see when we sketch in our people down here just how large this campus is in the center of Florence. First, I'd like to address our content here, the Palazzo Vecchio, which is uh, an urban castle. So we talk about castle, we talk about fortification, we talk about fortification, we wonder why. And so let's back up to the base of a man named Maslow who talked about the needs of the human condition. So he sees it in a, in a pyramidal form of stages of existence. And so at the base, fundamental at that base of the pyramid is what you need just to survive. And obviously the base is air, minute by minute to get you through life. After that is food and water, water first, and then food after that in terms of spanning more than several days. After that is actually defense or security. And that's where architecture comes in. So all the way back to the dawn of man, tens of thousands of years ago, the key aspect to survive day by day is to be able to sleep in shelter or defend your clan in shelter. So the idea of defense is what shapes a lot of early architecture. We see here in the 13th century, about 1299, the commune of the people of Florence decided to build a palace that would be worthy of the city's importance. Be more secure and defensible in times of turbulence and for the, the people who ran the town, the magistrates of the commune. So it's a key principle for architecture or shelter to provide that defense aspect to it. Now, the stages of that over time are kind of very, very slow in the beginning, assuming that a bone would have been the first thing again, thousands, tens of thousands of years ago as a weapon to defend yourself from other. And then eventually swords came in, bow and arrows, the longbow in the 12th century, um, gunpowder, a little bit earlier on, but more prolific in the 11th and 12th century moving forward. We have later developments from the gunpowder into guns and revolvers and things that would show multiple uh, uses of that to um, contemporary things in the 20th century would be more in a sense horrific between the types of rapid fire guns and planes and gases used, drones now, and obviously nuclear energy. So that, that changes the need for architecture itself to be self-defensive. And in this case, in this Palazzo Vecchio in the center of Florence, we're going to see a version of crenellated top for warfare. So in case they were under siege, they could defend themselves in city hall. So if you back up a little bit first, um, your notion of castles kind of whirl around, whether it's in um, Montessori, sort of the stereotypical idea of building up on a mount and having a large, huge fortified walls that would have chambers inside. And then the, the defending army would have the advantage of being above the, the warring tribe or clan. Here's another one in Germany, Heinbeck Castle, and one in Catalonia and Spain. And they all have the same type of naturalistic thing where they're actually building around the land itself. They're building up on mounts of high things. They're, they're surrounded by gates and walls. So if this fails, they hole up in the castle proper there and they come to the key piers or last vestige. So there are mechanics to castle design, which makes a romantic history of them. But the key thing there is to survive to the next day. And so we'll see remnants of that here, even in 1299, to protect the people of Florence. So uh, working off the model here, we'll see a very urbane type of palace and a rectangle form here, a courtyard with rooms around that to let natural light in. And then the architect um, 
de Cambio, Arnolfo de Cambio, who also did the Duomo and the Santa Croce Church in town, embedded the old medieval tower, even earlier than this, into the castle proper and then modernized the top aspect of it. So all along here are different elements of being able to protect themselves from any type of uh, feud. So in our case, when we start this off, we're going to take it from the view from the uh, piazza out front. We'll see David in the foreground there. Our subject matter on the right, the Galleria, which houses, uh, houses some other great um, sculptural pieces in there and little bits of Florence in the backdrop here, the Uffizi Gallery. So we'll kind of scale that very quickly here because it's all very urbane in terms of being orthographic projection of boxes. So let's locate our horizon line at the head using our 20% of a tourist or a group of people on that horizon line in the piazza. And so as they walk up closer to the David statue by Michelangelo, they'll see that their height is only up to the base and somebody walked up to it about the same height as the base of the pieces itself. So it's an immense scale of very large palazzo. Um, the, the town at the uh, palace itself inside as a town hall of Florence has got a, a great sort of vertical rise to command the kind of purview that it needs to as a governmental center. So down at the bottom here, about an inch and a half off the base is the horizon line. And we'll simply use the box of the building proper because we're, it has a, a trapezoidal view on this side as it goes out and addresses a city change on that end, but we're looking at it from this edge, which is a pure orthographic projection. So we can come back with our closest corner, the one that's further away from us over here. And then these horizontals then will project back to our left vanishing point, which will be almost at the edge of the page here. As this rushes down to that point, and this rushes down, and all the fenestration as well takes us back to that left vanishing point. We come to the corner, then the right vanishing point is further away. And that'll always give more dominance to one part of the elevation than the other. So we can kind of complete that box. The tops of all the arch windows will sketch into it. Add those points. And a very little bit then is beneath this, because obviously it comes down to the same part of the piazza as we do, the base in there, and then I'll project back to the left point. And this will rush back almost like a horizontal line, but it's not going to actually touch that horizon line until it's off the page here. Looks like it's about four inches off to the right or so. So if we follow up, then we want the, the extension of the tower coming up, which is another box-like form, but now it's tall and thin. So the base of it comes up to its corner aspect. We see a bit more of the front part of that elevation. And then it projects out and has a bump out. And then finally the two top pieces. And now the other buildings that are orthographically in line with the Palazzo here will also use the same vanishing point. So the Galleria over here on the right, and then the galleries for the museum behind it, all vanish back to that left point. And we see a little bit of the corner here. What's gonna happen, as you mentioned before, as you can see, there's a little bit, we're, we're close enough to it that we start to see the convergence of the vertical. So the one that's closest to us is almost a pure vertical. The tower is very long and driving us towards a point, which will be running off to the paper, probably two or three feet, but just the idea that we know those can't in a little bit show its drive toward the vertical. And so the, the verticals that are further away from us, there's a little bit at the edge of a perspective, you get more of a bow of the verticals because of 
it wraps around how we physically see. We'll have the edges of these that are being perfectly straight. They're all going to diminish to a point way off the paper to the right here. And we've done that once or twice in prior sketches. So it returns to the corner on the right point, returns to that point off the paper on the right point. The one behind it over here carries down to the left. There's a bit of a walkway between that and the next building. And the adjacent one is kind of an extension of the plan here that runs off down the street. Then it turns at this corner and we see the face of another significant building in the town. And then that has its own series of horizontal lines for the banding of windows. And again, since they are horizontal, they're going to come all the way across here to the right vanishing point. There's three large arches here. And they create this porch for the display of great sculpture from the Renaissance period. And what'll be nice about this is we'll be able to see back to the back wall of this. Uh, so this will be the interior of this arcade, but then we're gonna see through the corner here because this is the actual edge of the inside of the arcade. So now we're gonna see the face of this Galleria here going back toward that right vanishing point. So that'll be one of those key moments where we're in front of a building, we go inside or underneath it, and we continue through it to see something. So we get a depth of perspective going back in space. And then when it comes to this corner of the adjacent building, it'll vanish back to that left point. And that should hold our key boxes. What we'll, what we'll do here is we're going to light it from this edge like the photograph has, which will give us a nice base down here to cast a little bit of a shadow coming towards us. So off of our base corner, in our ground plane, which would be monolithic if we didn't do this, we want to pitch a nice tight angle of projected shadow all the way across. And then at a certain point, the angle of the sun will stop it and then it will vanish back to the right vanishing point. So we see a very slight plane of shadow line at the base. And maybe just to make sure we know it's there, we're going to make it more pronounced later. We'll simply fill in with 20% now. Like that back. And to hold us in terms of our zone is if we're trying to sketch out where we're going to head with our uh, 60 to 90 percent later on, we'll simply use the 20 now to realize that key for us would be going from this corner on back with a shadow line. So what we'll do here before we um, get too far along is we're going to show the most impressive part of it being a medieval urban castle by showing the crenellated top, which would allow the archers to stand above and shoot down to the nemesis below. We want to hold on to that because that's got a nice sort of dental profile against the sky later. Same is true up top here. So now when we assign value to that, we want to make sure that we use a small enough chisel point there to start with the value for what's being on the shade side of the building, leaving white of the sky adjacent to it. Now, as we have the dentals established, we can simply start to draw our first piece of 
value across here and, and assign primary and secondary places for the light to move across the sketch. Now it's only 20% now and eventually we get all the value in. It'll read more like almost page white, but this is just because of the sense of how we're gonna build up the language for this. Now we can also assume that if this comes up and then cast a shadow, it'll cast a shadow on the uh, Galleria too. And so if the shadow ends here, we can assume that this part will have a cast shadow onto it. And then and we'll stop right about there. And this will be lighter. Let me turn the corner. We turn back. And this will go shade wise around that corner, but it'll hold that edge as well. So we're gonna set up this movement of box cornered, diminishes back, reaches another box, cornered, diminishes back, finds another box in the backdrop here. So these are all going to be lit by that sun coming from this direction. And this one on the backdrop will be parallel to this side. So that's where we have another value going back over here. Now, much like this came down and hit the grade and projected a shadow onto this uh, neighboring building, this will do the same. It'll come across here and cast a shadow on the lower marks of this. It'll step down more. And the suns join these all three in the same shade line. Channel line, excuse me. And so that'll again give us the right idea, an idea of sketch of how I'd like the sun to work in here because obviously the light, shade, and shadow is as big a tool as the line work is. So take that shade side up to the corner here, starting with a harder edge. The shade starts to just simply pull that across. And then this obviously on the other side of the palazzo will have a deeper shadow cast on the neighboring building. A little bit of light will bounce around so we don't have that the same tone. It'll be brighter over here because this is more of a smaller alleyway. That's a little bit more of a pedestrian walkway there. So we want to make sure we, we design the face of that. That's an important building as well, the, the art gallery that we have to make that part of the subject matter, not quite as dominant as this, but we'll watch how we develop that. And now on the underside, we see the front face of the arches come around and then facing this way is the same arch perpendicular to it. And now this will have the same type of thing happen here, but it'll die into a support for it on the wall itself. And we'll see that happen again here with that arch. So that's the inside structure of the vault that holds this space that goes from the base of these columns to that back wall. And then that has a detail or tone to it, the base, which is darker than the wall proper. And then from this wall joint element, which holds, takes the arch and buries it down into the wall proper, it's got ribs that spring out from that. And we only see them on, mostly just on this one. It's a little bit oblique here. And now we can do a little bit of value. Maybe we'll pop into three now. With all the areas that are going to be darker because they're glazed areas to show in the interior. And so there's simply as a repetition across. We'll start lower on with... Sizes, little portal. You can see it's not really 
a century or two, this will all open up because warfare changes. And so the castles end up saying to be designed into more palaces. They're open and glazed because you can't stop the new artillery. So you have to stop it outside of the city because if they come this far with the newest weaponry later on, you've already lost. And then at the second level, they're paired arched openings that march along the facade. So they have a tree right above it, so they line up. And just follow that along the path here. And there's a singular one towards the tower. So again, the tower was already existing from a prior time where towns like San Gimignano and Siena, Siena still has about oh six or seven of these towers. San Gimignano has maybe 12 left, but at one time San Gimignano had about 70. So the idea was uh, individual families would build very tall slender towers and they'd simply wall off the base and they'd go up into the tower and try to survive the threat of attack at the base. So now I have the buttresses. We'll see the underside, those in terms of value supporting this piece, again, for the longer archers up top. And now there are four arches in the top of this box up here. So we're going to see through the two that face us. Then we're going to see the right side with an opening over here and the left side with a little bit of an opening with there on there, that side. So it's darker here, but again, we wanna have our view into the space, through the space, and that white's very important to show that's a volume up there. It's not an enclosed space. It simply is covered. And then fenestration wraps around this side. There's double sets of windows. It'll appear more like one stroke of our ink. And there's five on each tier here. And then the same type of support here that enlarges the towers that goes up, enlarges the top here, because not only is there a way to have the um, masters of the bow and arrow up here, or even long boy at this time, they had a pop-out floor here where you could actually drop things through the floor if people are trying to engage the second floor or ladders or attack, things can be uh, placed liquid-wise in the floor part here. And that wraps around this whole, and let's see how that projects under a little bit of a heavy arch shadow and marches across the entire skin here. We'll simply make a little U-turn and then drop down. These are all vanishing back in perspective toward that right vanishing point. And then openings on that upper deck up there. Little slender arches. And then we see just sort of the line of those as it wraps around the building on this side. So that should establish our, our zone for evaluating the building with value. So we can now move into four, five, and six to kind of collect high points here. We'll do the most with four, a little bit less with five and six, and the same thing happens with seven, eight, nine, even less of those three. So moving to four now. And come into all of our e dark areas and highlight some of the fenestration now, just with the point of the pen. And we'll probably pull back and make sure that our definition of detail is strongest right here to the tower on this corner that's the closest part of the architecture that's towards us in terms of our subject. 
You don't want to make your repetition too similar across the way. You can do double strokes if you like. Skip one periodically so there's a change of identification there. It's all solid, rusticated stone. Simple tower that has a clock on it now. And trying to incorporate the existing tower made the floor plan asymmetrical. You'd expect the tower to be design more centralized, but since it's marrying old architecture to a newer design at the turn of the century there, uh, you can see in the model form over here how it's justified to the right here in terms of its final outlook. We'll pick up the little bit of the calculation over here on this side as well. It wraps around and here it's more Definitive because we see the entire outline of the feature in the elevation front. And we want to make sure we identify that corner really, really strongly. So take the thinner edge of the blunt side and come back and start and build up maybe the first three or four value. And then again, start here with your four and drag it along from left to right. And even with the line work that shows up, it'll pick up the quality of the stone as we kind of move along in the sketch. And then drop that four down because that's a key line in the construction of this and the turn of light from shade to shadow here. And then all the way over. And just that overlap with the chisel point kind of gives some of that striation of stone that we're looking for to make it even appear more weighty rather than having a nice clean path to it. So that edge will work out a little bit. Now we're going to do the same over here from the top of the Galleria. Take that top edge all the way across and then we've got a couple of component parts sort of in the corners here that are detailed differently. So we'll take that corner and draw it across to our point where the shadow ends. And then we'll make it darker and have, even though it's in the shade behind it, we're gonna make that more bright so we can move our volumes and pull this piece in front of that back elevation there. So we'll keep that one about here. The underside, which is darker, the column that's in front, the underside, which is darker, the column in the front, underside arch wraps, and it's held by this collective piece on the wall, it's engaged in the wall, and then some of the ribs again, and then finally the last column which is get the biggest flare toward that vanishing point off the page at the top. And then we turn the corner again. So we'll simply show the side face of this. And since this is the one that faces the piazza, there's less detail over here. It returns and it's more of a blank wall. And then a neighboring block. So then Italian palace starts over here. So pull that corner back. And then show the base for all these columns here on the piazza. You now, as this turns around on this corner, it does have its darkest points. So we're going to go from our darker edge here against the white paper of this of the sun hitting this elevation, fade to a lighter gray, and then have the darker edge of this face of this building over here. And that's got a more um, Renaissance skin to it, which engage pilasters as it builds up. And at the base, it's got big block openings. 
and we can value that out for now. Key window structure and above that another window structure that wraps around and repeats itself and then repeats and repeats. So now we've got one, two, three subjects. We'll build a little more down here and then we'll make our one on the center of the dominant structure. We want to give our people a little bit of presence now since we washed them out with that cast shadow. We could do one with a dark torso, one with darker legs. Turns in there. And then a little cast shadow for them. And we'll do the same for David here. And I believe uh, Michelangelo, this is uh, before the battle. So he's very confident, studied, and prepared for the fight with Goliath. Now I'll turn the corner and come over and show some of the detail on this side of the building. Here are the neighboring structures, and here's a key corner against the sky now. So we can take, we'll probably jump back to three just to try it for now, but we need to have this be strong against the sky on this side. So pull the three off that corner certainly at the top, and then less along here. We'll decide whether we want to put two back in there later on. Once we add the sky, we'll make some decisions. And now we'll come up to the tower and realize that our number four, with the corner is very important to us. We want to make sure we draw our dark underneath. those three And since this is all in shade down here, we'll come back with the floor to these columns. And as the light comes down, it's washing the wall brighter towards the base and there's less light coming up. So if we drop back to three here, we can create a little bit more of a volume by taking the flat chisel part and going stronger at the top and letting it loose as we pull it down to the bottom. And we'll do the same with the four. And so that'll start to push that space back away from the edge of our columns as we move forward. Find the edge of those. I see the last light. And now the buildings here are, are secondary. They're getting they're the furthest part of the sketch that's away from us. This kind of keeps a nice boxed open piazza here. This goes back and diminishes. So that cut plane of that shadow line, at the base of our building and hits again here. So we can edge that out again and make that a little bit stronger line. Up to our two people. Get 
base the building and then shadow down this little alleyway there'd be more buildings in the backdrop there but obviously it's a dark tone and this little bit as it meets that building ends up being almost flush there as well so we'll just see a little turn in those buildings there but they're lit up so we can come back in and with the point of the four just stroke in a little bit of darkness we'll see as these arcade of lines pick up sort of an extension of the palazzo here. Uh, the central one. And now the distance, I think we can probably put them with a four here now and just sort of drop that out later with value. And then we'll see some straight on to us in terms of our view. The arch entryway is a grade. And then a series of windows. And the finance roof line and the projected shadow from beneath that roof line. A little bit of banding. So that's about as much information we want because that we'll keep it in the background. We'll, we'll keep as we move from 50 to 90 percent, we're going to build all our information within this middle third of the sketch then. So I would think now uh, we could probably draw what we want to do with the sky. So let's pull these back for a second. Uh, we won't necessarily emulate the photograph here, but we will go to a 20 percent just to start some range of value change. So right, we'll kind of go right over our Maslow's pyramid here and we'll do something that has, uh, maybe we'll run them contrary to the movement of this perspective. We'll have the sky do its own change. We'll run it off and have it go off on this kind of diagonal. And so closer to us, bigger and broader than the same as they go back in space the clouds are always sort of in their own dominion of vanishing back so this distance means the same cloud but shouldn't less distance as it goes back in perspective so now we kind of extend that by going deeper and further with the same line work and then pull those through And now we can simply then kind of go every other one of the value at the 20%. Just to wash that tone in now. It'll start out strong and kind of dissipate. So I would come through with this one. And it's fairly forgiving because they are clouds and they can be very, very amorphic. And now adjacent to the white of the tower, this will help the shaft kind of penetrate that softness of the sky. And we'll take this whole area up to this corner. Run all the way down to the building edge then. And now repeat at the base of some of them so they get a little bit stronger right at the edge. We'll start to make the shape a little more cloud like.
And then again, to make this our heroic white in the foreground here, we don't want the base to compete with it. So even if it's not having a shadow cast on it, the stone base, the piazza, should be a value too. So we'll start with 20%. We'll probably add 30 as well. And let's just wash that whole thing out for now. And let it go to white in front of this part over here. And that way it'll, it'll move a little bit for us. So that's all of our placement of value and setup. That's typically done 20 through 40, maybe even 50. But now we'll start with 50 to 90 and just simply do this, the um, same work over and over again with less time as the number gets higher. So working right to left, I'm going to come back and highlight all the key line work now that we think is the most important. So certainly the top of the crenellated part here, and the very top of the crenellation, wrapping around the outside edge here. That drops down and has the cant, which pops out the tower. <clears throat> And the strength of that, and now the undersides. You see the sh shade side of all the machicolations moving around. You see the whole form here faces this. We see just the ribbon, which because it gets washed out by the sun, we just see the ribbon of the shade side. So same unit, but it changes character on what skin you're drawing it for. And that drops down on this cant's back. The cant's back on that side, so that edge is important to make sure we, we bring that back in. And now that edge is really strong for us against that alley. And this one's strong against the sky. That corner is really important. Really kind of puncture this corner up in that deep end there. And then the underside of all these arches again. Maybe you don't go all the way across the skin this time. But now we're putting grays on top of grays, so that'll enhance and change the light quality and the variety of detail that the eye is attracted to. And some of these are, can be more reflective, which means they're reflecting the sky and they're brighter. And then some can be as if the window's open and you can see directly in the glaze is not there. Some could be shown the two panels of glazing. Difficult to do float glass back then. So everything was done with, with small pieces of glazing and, and lead between them to connect them. And there are two uh, prominent entries right here behind the David. We'll pull those down to here. And we'll keep coming down this edge again. Maybe not with a continuous line. And now we'll take the five and we'll run it from this edge and just pull up. We'll come back to some key horizontals here. But the rest is fairly mirror. We'll come back in later and do a little bit of detailing to show variation of the stone along the way. And this is enough for just moving five across the skin for now. We can pull up just a couple of these toward the right side of it. Just to jump a little interest in the backdrop. And maybe there's a way we can take the range of value of our two for cloud 
and run the three over here so it gets a little bit deeper right by the buildings. Now with the 20%, just really quickly draw the clock in, which is right at the base on top of it. Sensible area. It's almost a pure circle, but it is inscribed in the box. It's in perspective there. Just leave there maybe just a couple little tiny Tick marks to indicate the clock's mechanism. And we'll move up to 60%. Maybe we'll start right to left here now. And we'll show the ribbing more in detail here on the vault that's on the inside. The underside of this arch is being carried and the right side of the column that's in shade. Repeat that, the right side of the carried element. Another room, the underside of the arch. Down, and we see a little bit of the edge of it behind that column. And a little bit of the underside of that twin arch that wraps around the corner, then we see the Underside of the front arch and down. And the glazing inside those windows, top and bottom. And then we'll come down right where that dash shadow hits the grade and make sure the base of the building is a nice strong line. And there are people there. And now to 70%. Oh, we'll go to the tower first. Sorry, with the six.
when you're drawing detailed lines that span across an entire space, remember, get your palm off the paper and draw from your shoulder as an access point. And number seven, being quicker this time through. You go left to right, pull out just one or two key windows on the edge of the building. Maybe come down to the base of that board or so, even though it's just a couple of blurs of gray in there by showing three different tones in that gray, it creates an interest and pulls the eye down that corridor. As the tops of these get very dark against the brilliance of the sun. They get very dark against the sun, casting that shadow in that triangulated pitch off the building height. And number And finally, number nine. It's going to be darkest right near our critical corner here. I think we'll retreat to a number three and turn the chisel on its point part and now simply come across with a varying of different types of stone texture, which we'll see in this shade area. We'll simply take it down to the base. And make the variety strongest right by our key corner here. You can see that alcohol inside kind of bleeds out of the paper, which helps the textural quality. We could pull it a little bit over toward 
They return to the other vanishing point. As you go further away, you see less that potential for that information of that kind of detail. And then maybe do it with number four, too. Again, on the chisel point, and just kind of get a little bit of idea of passing several in a row, going back to that vanishing point. And we'll just quickly move from 40 to 50 and come around to some of the edges one last time. Some of the key aspects we want to make sure are the most defined. And now, as mentioned before, this 2% put down at the very base is kind of washed out to page white again. So we're going to come across with a 30% and just pull some of the lines from the vanishing points just out in the piazza as if the clouds themselves are changing patterns on this form over here. So coming off that left point, you just wash that line out from this corner, take that out, take it back a little further back, coming from the other point, this way, and it might then through the lines on top of the tone there, kind of hold that plane down a little bit more on the base. So the foreground is also very key. We don't have a whole lot of information in the foreground here unless we put in more people there. Now we can turn the virgin in some drier points of a 20 or 30 for things that might be less naturalistic now, so we'll simply leave them out here. So there we have our you know, the tower. Of Palazzo Vecchio.